Hi guys, it's Emily, and today I'm here to bring you a mystery history talk. Um, before I begin, I want to shout out Olive over at a book Olive because her Russian history retreat series is what inspired me to make these videos. And then I also want to give a disclaimer that I'm going to be talking about some pretty gruesome murders in this video. So if that's something that's going to bother you, uh, I would skip this and come back for the next mystery history talk, which is going to be a lot less, um, bloody, I will say. Now we can move into the fun stuff. Picture, if you will, Austin, Texas in late 1884. Austin is on its way to becoming a great city. There are 17,000 people living in the city. It's Texas's capital city, and it fended off an attempt to move the capital back to Houston in 1841. There was this event called the Texas Archive War, where supporters of Sam Houston attempted to take all of the government documents from Austin and take them back to take them back to Houston, but they were stopped by a loyal Austin citizen named Angelina Eberly. And then, so the University of Texas is being built, and there's an imposing new Capitol building, building being built as well. There's an amusement park, and there's an opera house where singers from both New York City and Europe come to sing. The price of cotton is very high, and there's a lot of mowing, money flowing in and out of the city. There's a semi-professional baseball team, which is called the Austins, and the circus comes to town regularly. So, overall, Austin's prospects are pretty good. But then, in the early morning of December 31st, 1884, Molly Smith is murdered, and her boyfriend, Walter Spencer, Walter Spencer is knocked unconscious via a blow to the head with an axe. Molly's body is found in an alley near the shanty she shares with Walter. Her head is split in two, and her has been stabbed multiple times. Her organs are exposed, and there's literally a pool of blood around her when she's found. The undertaker tries to put her in a coffin, and he has to pick up multiple parts of her body because her body is basically falling apart in his hands. This is the first appearance of the serial killer known as the Mer Midnight Assassin. Now, the Austin, Poli the Austin Police Department is not equipped to handle this. There's only 12 policemen in the department, and none of them has ever had to solve a murder before. Most of the Austin murders are very simple, you know, clear-cut cases of, like, saloon shootouts or, you know, rivalry or something very obvious. Um, Sergeant John Chenneville, the number two man at the department, tries using the blood hounds at the department to track a scent, but the dogs don't find anything. The... Um, the murder attracts much gossip, but nobody's particularly worried. Um, it's assumed that Molly's either killed by Walter, and his, then he self-inflicted his own wound, or that she was killed by her ex-boyfriend, Lim, Lim Brooks, and Lim was known to be jealous of um, Molly and Walter. So people go on to the New Year's Eve parties that night, and they're still talking about, you know, Austin's prosperity, and how 1885 is going to be the best year yet in the city. Well, little do they know. So, Lim is arrest arrested and then released due to lack of evidence. Life goes on. And then in March, after the biggest parade ever held in Austin for the 49th anniversary of Texas Independence Day, servant women across the city begin being awakened in the night by a ghost. Seven different women report being terrorized by this ghost, and all of them are black. So the white citizens start to think that this is a gang of like black men who are running around terrorizing people. Race relations are very tense in Austin during this time, as the first generation of black men who were not born into slavery are coming of age, and the white people believe that these men are not showing the proper for deference to their place. You know, they're being really outspoken about how they want more rights and things like that. Well, the servant girl assaults um, caused demand for the hiring of more policemen and for electric lights to be put up in the city, but nothing much happens. The chief of police, or marshal as he's known, Grooms Lee, is widely seen as being an, an ineffective political appointment who has very little law enforcement experience. So a few temporary policemen are hired, but for a while nothing seems to happen. 
But the assault start back up on April 29th, and then in the early hours of May 7th, 1885, Black Cook Eliza Shelley is found with her head axed open. There are witnesses, three set three young sons, but none of them saw the killer's face. And a local man known to be dating Eliza, Ike Plummer, is arrested and then later released. Now there's another murder on May 2nd. Irene Cross, another black cook, and another witness is reported, her 12-year-old nephew. And there are more assaults into mid-June, and then things stop for a while, and then on August 29th, um, Mary Ramey is killed, and she's an 11 year old girl, and her mother is knocked unconscious. And Mary is killed in a very gruesome way. A long iron rod is stuck through her ear into her brain, and it basically causes her brain fluid to come out. And the scene that was described was very, very gruesome. Very bad. By now, there's bad press all over Texas. The city hired two private detectives, two sets of private detectives, one from Houston and then one from Chicago, and neither of them do much good, and the murders keep going on. Now, there's assaults in late September, and then in September, on September 28th, four people are attacked. They have Grace Vance and Orange Washington, who are a couple, invite two of their friends who were scared to sleep alone to stay at their house. And these friends are Lucinda Body and Patsy Gibson. And Orange is killed in the shanty. And Gracie is actually found in the yard behind the shanty with a silver wrist watch on her wrist. And what it doesn't belong to her. It's later to be found to have been found stolen, but from another servant woman earlier that evening. And then Lucinda and Patsy are badly beaten, but they survive. Multiple men are arrested, including an ex-boyfriend of Gracie's, but no case will stick. There's still nobody knows who's doing this. So Walter Smith, Molly's or Walter Spencer, Molly Smith's boyfriend, is taken to trial for her murder but found innocent. And then Marshall Lee is found to be incompetent. And so they, um, the department and the city council vote to replace him with James Lucy, who was a former Texas Ranger. And so then there's a, bit, a little bit of a quiet period. And, but then the drama increases on Christmas Eve, 1885. Um, two white society women, both who were very wealthy, are murdered via act. Both Susan Hancock and Eula Phillips. And they're both murdered the same way on the same night. So that's just crazy. And of course, as you can expect, the murders suddenly take on a new urgency. And 20 new policemen are hired that very Christmas Eve. And people start um, rioting in the streets because they're so frightened by this crazy lunatic that's out acting white women. And so all day during Christmas Day, 1885, the streets are full of citizens. Alarm systems and guns are sold out throughout the city, and uh, people are arrested on the slightest provocation. And the New Year's Eve city plans were canceled, and there was a famous opera singer that was scheduled to come sing on the, December 28th, and she still comes, but she has to have a crew of body, bodyguards with her to protect her from this crazed lunatic. The, these, uh, murder of the, these murders of the two white women also caused the end of a political career. Eula Phillips was found to be having multiple affairs at an, a house of ill repute, including possibly having an affair with William J. Swain, who was the state comptroller at the time, and he was the favorite to be the next governor of Texas. And so um, there was a suspicion that he was the one who even had murdered Eula. And so he worked, he tried really hard to clear his name, but he lost lost the election for the governorship in 1886 to Sewell Ross. So these murders were taking on a, a very big um, proportion in terms of what was going on. And then, um, on August 31st, 1866, um, Patty Scott, another black servant woman, was axed in the head in San Antonio. And her husband, William, was suspected. But the murder, um, it causes panic to spread to San Antonio. People start believing that maybe this midnight assassin has gone down to, to expand his net of, of crime. 
The husbands of the two Christmas Eve victims, Jimmy Phillips and Moses Hancock, are arrested and sent to trial. Jimmy was actually found guilty of U.S. murder, but his trial was appealed and he later was released off bail and the charges were later dismissed. Moses' trial was declared a mistrial and then he never really had anything else happen about it after that. So... After the January murder in San Antonio, there's no more murders ever in Austin. But in, on July 13th, 1886, there were two murders in Gainesville, Texas, which is about 250 miles north of Austin. Gainesville is sort of not a suburb of Dallas, but pretty close to Dallas. And in Gainesville, two white teenage girls, Jeannie Watkins and Mammy, Mammy Boswick, were found after to death in Mammy's bedroom, and the panic starts to spread to Dallas, but no arrests were ever made. So, again, there was never any murders in um, Austin or even in Texas, but in September of 1886, Jack the Ripper starts his spree of crime in Whitechapel in London, and there was a lot of discussion in the newspapers and even in some academic circles that perhaps the Midnight Assassin and um, had moved to England and developed this new persona of Jack the Ripper. However, the Midnight Assassin and Jack the Ripper have different methods of killing, and, and so it's not really plausible that it can be the same person, but there is still a lot of speculation. Um, nobody really knows what happened to the Midnight Assassin. He was never arrested, and his, his identity was never really um, found out at all, despite all the arrests. So, the attacks of the Midnight Assassin were the first time in American history, really, that someone had so systematically killed their victims. You know, at first, black gangs were seen to be the perpetrator, but then as it went on, people became increasingly convinced that it was just one person, some sort of very systematic person who was probably pretty normal in the day. And so, of course, today, we would consider that person a psychopath. And there was even these alienists, who are basically what are modern-day psychologists that um, discussed the murder at several conferences, and there was the new theories developed as as a result, you know, these, these new theories of just, like, systematic person who could kill people and then still lead a normal life. In present day, there are people known as Austinologists who still believe that the murder can be solved and still are doing research on it. And then there are also people called Ripperologists who study Jack the Ripper who believe that Jack and the Midnight Assassin are still the same person. And the killer, the Midnight Assassin, is also known in some circles as the Servant Girl Annihilator because he did prim primarily attack servant women. So today, in Austin, you can still see symbols of the city sphere of this Midnight Assassin. There are still 15 um, moonlight towers around the city. And when these towers were first installed, they were 31 towers, and they were installed in 1895 to combat the darkness that made it so easy to... Um, for the killer to hide, which shows that the sphere of the killer progressed long, long after the murders had stopped. People were still scared of them. And of course, today, these moonlight towers are very outshined by modern day technology, um, you know, modern day lighting and things like that. And yet, they are still a symbol of how fear can, can, can cause very broad damage to a city's psyche and to a city's reputation as well. The Midnight Assassin is practically a forgotten figure. I've lived in Texas 20 years, and I'd never heard of him until I heard that Kip Hollyworth was coming out with this book, which is The Midnight Assassin, um, Panic, Scandal, and the Hunt for America's First Seri Serial Killer, which was the primary source for this discussion. And this is a really great book, by the way, if you're looking for a true crime novel to read. But yeah, it's so fascinating how, you know, Jack the Ripper has captured our imagination and there's not about him and there's still research done about him and people are still trying to figure out his identity but this um, midnight assassin sort of got away and isn't even in popular culture anymore so some mysteries can never be solved and that's pretty crazy right so that's it for today thanks for so much for watching i hope you enjoyed my mystery history talk number one and i'll be back again soon with another one um see you next time bye